Did you already turn it on? Yeah. Right. Do you want to it off? They're going to wonder why I'm laughing. Verse, verse 3. Uh, and he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? All right. Um, keep going. Verse 4. But what kind of uh, pronoun is T, by the way? Uh, that would be an interrogative. I always think of interrogation. There you go. All right, keep going. Okay. And here we go. Uh, but they said, Moses allowed, and this was a little bit confusing, um, a book. I don't know what that, how the book part fits into that, but um, a notice of divorce to be written and to release or send divorce. divorce. Yeah, a notice of divorce. To, uh, to, uh, Moses allowed to write a uh, to write a notice. I like that to write a notice of divorce and to divorce. Or Mo Moses permitted to write and to divorce. So bibliography there would be. Yeah, the book is probably not a good translation. I, I agree. Yeah, so notice, yeah. But what case is it? Biblion? Accusative. It's accusative case? How is it used? Wait, Biblion. No. I want to go away. It's an accusative and it's a direct object. What's a direct object of? Um, what was allowed to be written? So it's the <coughs> graph side? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. Apostasio. What case is that and <coughs> what, how is that used? say relationship? No, there's no people. Oh yeah, that's true. Oh. This is a bit challenging, isn't it? Content, not like a bucket or something, but you know, <laughs> the uh, you know, verbal content of it. Mm -hmm. So it could be that. It might not be too abusive. Huh? General reference? Um, maybe. A notice with, with reference to divorce? Yeah, it could be that. It might not be too abusive to call it a descriptive genitive. Uh, but I, I like content, and reference is probably workable as well. Who wants to do verse number five? Give it a shot and we'll clean it up. Could have said, you know, um, 
He could have said because in, in a different kind of way, right? You know, very various ways you could do that, deal with the accusative or other things. Uh, but he uses something very unusual to express causation. Um, cross. Now, th this is a case where where cross seems to be used in a way that's somewhat unusual for it. So just to say cross means to or toward with the accusative, um, you know, she said uh, toward the hardness of your heart. Um, What's he you know, he toward the hardness of their heart? Huh? Well, I think, here's where you have to kind of go back, you know, to the meaning of the preposition is the movement toward and the, the uh, you know, the, the, the case, the accusative case is a case of limitation and you know, hardness of heart is the meaning of that. It seems to me that, you know, um, confronting the hardness of your heart, you know, almost like you come up to a wall, which is the hardness of your heart. You know, so in confrontation with the hardness of your heart, he wrote this command. In other words, Moses was, you know, confronted with, or confronted, however you want to look at it, the hard heartedness, and that's where the command comes from. That's the way I would look at that. One of the categories says opposition in the book, which is against the hardness of your heart. Would that make sense? Page 170, it says. Yeah, it's kind of the idea. Um, I call it a, a, an association, but, like with a state of verb, or in company with hardness. Yeah, but it's not really against. He's not writing the command to uh, to uh, do anything about the hardness of their heart. He's doing. Uh, he's writing the command to accommodate the hardness of their heart, not to change it so much. So I mean, the way I'm looking at it is, you know, he's he is, uh, you know, uh, coming up against something that's immovable, the hardness of their heart, and therefore he has to allow for that. So, you know, to translate it, because of the hardness of your heart, it's probably about as good as this, that's going to get, just for a, for a trans, you know, non-expanded translation. Right? Um, I guess you could say confronting the hardness of your heart. Here. Well, association with mm, I don't know if that gets at it as well. In association, I don't think association. Now that you're thinking of association would be like, it, um, and the word was toward God. That's, a, that's the association use of cross. But I don't think, I don't think you have association here. All right, uh, verse 6. I haven't gone yet. Okay. <clears throat> or do you want to do it? Oh, no, go ahead. This is kind of short, so I don't have to do Septuagint. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, when you have these quotations, particularly from the Septuagint, you know you're into harder Greek sometimes. Ooh, it's, it's classic. Especially I don't have any helps. <laughs> I got you back. Okay. All right, let's go. Yeah, we got to remember that. I try. Um, from the beginning of creation, he um, made them male and female. Um, okay. Here we go. Hineke. Don't know that. Well, well, for this reason, because of this. Oh, because of this. Which is um, another way you could have. They. What? In, you know, that another yeah. option instead of cross that we could have used. Go ahead. Oh. Uh, for this reason. Uh, they um, they will be mm -hmm. future. Is that future or is that? Yes. Or is that? Well, it's a future, and okay. we're going to study the use of the future, but this is probably a future of command, a command type future. You know, so you could, a they man should, should leave. leave. Yeah. Man should leave. Oh, a man, yeah. A man should leave his father and mother. Um, and Ooh. Okay, join to his wife. Yeah, and in English, you know, we say cleave to his wife. And the word cleave is really an interesting word in English because it can either mean I never to, to separate, <laughs> so you have a meat cleaver, you know, or you have a cleave, um, into. cleave into. being to join together, as in beaver cleaver. No, I don't know that. But, um, <laughs> um, well, the cleaver family, I guess. I don't know. I mean, that's that's exactly. the um, yeah, that's an odd this word. Is the only, the, the, here it means to join together. The Bible is the only place I've ever heard that. Join <coughs> I've always heard, you know, the, you know, cleft in a rock and 
you know, cleaved, right? <laughs> I don't understand how they use that in English. But, you know. Yeah, all right. <clears throat> um, uh, out to, that's a, a genitive case there, isn't it? Uh, how would, what, what use of the genitive would that be? Um, no, it's possessive. You could call it a genitive of possession. You, you could. There's another option you might want to try as well. Both would probably be equally good. You might. Genitive of a relationship? Yeah, you could call it that. Now, genitive of relationship typically is meant as something a little bit different than that, maybe, but it, it is about, that is talking about relationships, so you probably could tag that as a genitive of a relationship. His, Father and um, mother, uh, and cleave toward his wife. That's interesting, isn't it? Cross, cleave toward his wife. So uh, maybe that is cross used in, as an associative kind of thing. Stacy, right? Yeah. Toward his wife, you know, cross. That's, that's probably used in a similar way to cross in a word with, with God. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of well, the next verse is, is kind of gives that kind of explanation to yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah, now this is interesting. Yeah, and the two will be into sarcomia, into one flesh. Now, since we're talking about prepositions, this is kind of interesting, isn't it? Now, what, what was the rule he said? If you have a transitive verb and a non-action preposition, it kind of makes the preposition action, action, action-y, right? If you have a um, if you have an actiony preposition and a non actiony verb, it takes the action out of the preposition. Um, so in that case, ace would become n. So and the two will be in one flesh. You might say in the realm of one flesh. But I have a suspicion that in this case. All of the actions not taken out of that preposition by that stated verb. Then it goes on to say so that. You see it, don't you? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, it, it's, it's talking about a state. You have a verb of being, a state of being in one flesh. But it's a state that is the result of an action. Right. And I'll let you figure the details of that out. <laughs> Could you explain what you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I've been working on that for 20 years. It definitely is a state of action. <laughs> a state of action. <laughs> <laughs> or where, yeah, a state of action. <laughs> <laughs> I think this would be a great way to explain it. <laughs> To a youth group <laughs> order my kids someday. The whole problem. <coughs> well, let me take you to the Greek text. Kids. Yeah, <laughs> uh, all right, so that. No, no longer are they two, but one flesh. No longer are they two, but one flesh. All right, therefore, ha, that which God joined together. Let not a man separate. He put a stump there. Yes, that's right. Um, so here we have ha, a relative pronoun. Uh, therefore, that which God joined together. Um, so how does how does ha that which function in that clause. Relative pronouns are tough because they're out of word order in English. And in English, we rely so much on word order to see the function uh, and instead of grammatical concept that relative pronouns are very tough for us. But how does that relative pronoun function in that clause? That which God joined together. Uh -huh. One flesh, isn't it? Huh? In singular, does it go back to flesh? Well, yeah, conceptually, that which, you know, yeah, you know, that, that, that couple or whatever. Um, how does that? It, it, link, it links the noun or 
rather substantive to your relative cost? Well, <clears throat> yeah, it does what a relative pronoun does. But how does it function in its clause? This clause <coughs> is, therefore, that which God joined together. That's right. It's the object of, of joined together. Okay. God's the subject. God joined that which together. So that's the object, the direct object of that verb. Now, catch this. That whole relative clause is, how does that function? That which God joined together, let not a man separate. Let a man not separate. It's all uh, the object of that. It's all the object of that verb. I don't know if I'm going to say that correctly. It is the direct object of that verb. Corinza. Uh, and in our, our relative, uh, you know, this is not referring back to anything specifically stated in the previous context. So, like for example, you know, is it one flesh? Well, it would have to be feminine then, wouldn't it? You know, that which God joined together. Well, it's really kind of a principle applied to marriage at that point. So God joined the marriage together. So really, it's it's almost a concept that comes out of that that that's referring to. And so, what kind of relative pronoun are we, are we speaking of there? On our dog-eared page. Whoops, that's on the dog-eared page. Those are the prepositions. No. Relative pronouns. I'm not sure what you mean. It talks about under antecedent complexities, omission of the antecedent. The antecedent may be omitted for a variety of reasons in Greek, for example. The other pronoun may incorporate a demonstrative pronoun, in which case the object is clear enough in the context. Less frequent, but no less significant exegetic instance of poetic material woven into the fabric of a discourse. And th this is somewhat poetic, isn't it? The language that we're using. And uh, really, there's a reference not to some specific thing in that context, but there's a reference to an idea out of that context. <clears throat> All right. Who would like to read now? I think we're on uh, verse 10. Okay. Um, and into the house, the disciples concerning this began asking him again. Okay. Now that's weird. I know. I like doing some comments. <laughs> yeah. It helps clarify. It. <coughs> but well, it's really something assumed there, right? And going into the house again. Mm -hmm. But you gave a fine translation of that. Um, now, if it were just in, and in the house again, you know, that would be fine. But into, again, implies movement. So it's kind of assuming that you understand it. It's going into the house again. Now, you said asked him again, or is it going into the house again? I have a feeling it's going into the house again. The disciples asked him certain things. I don't think they asked him about that again. I think they went into the house again. There's no indication that they asked him about that before. And why would they? He just said it. Um, try verse 11, too. Okay. And he said to them, whatever, yeah, whoever, whoever, sorry, um, might release or divorce his wife um, and marry another commits a 
adultery against her. All right, now you translate that against her. Normally you think of kata with the genitive as being against, mm -hmm. right? but this is epi, um, commits adultery upon her. Now I think, the data. I, think I think we're using very, you know, I think the language is spatially graphic here, basically. But at the same time, I think it also indicates that there is a burden put upon her uh, at the same time. Shame uh, Well, the idea, yeah, that I, sort of, yeah. Um, I, think, I think there's almost a double entendre here, where, you know, commits adultery on her, in a very literal kind of sense, but, but also it, it places something on her. She is now an adulteress. <laughs> We like to translate that against her. But. All right. Um, okay, nobody wants to volunteer to read anymore. Um, yes, two days. Uh, where are we at? 12. 12. I want to do 12. I will. All right. And if she divorces her husband, Okay, what kind of word is apalu sa sa? It looks like a participle. It is a participle. What tense? That would be accusative. Um, no, it's not as nominative, but what, what tense um, is it? Aorist. That's right, it's an aorist participle. And so, and if she, after divorcing her husband, marries another, that's right, uh, commits adultery. He, she commits adultery. She's a, understood, I guess. That's right. All right. Very good. Um, all right. Verse thirteen. Verse thirteen. Okay, Stacy's ready to rock and roll now. There's a change of scene here, kind of. Go yep. to and they brought to him children that he might touch them, but uh, the disciples rebuked them. And Jesus, seeing this, became indignant and told them, Let the children uh, come to me, do not hinder them, for such is the kingdom. Okay, very nice. Now, um, uh, let's let's work through this. Auto. What case is that? The of. Give me a case in usage of auto. We said it's a dative. The direct object. No. Mm -hmm. Typical use of a dative. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's paideia? Children. Mm -hmm. What case of usage? Children are the direct object. That's right, that's accusative, direct object. What's auto? Oh, well, indirect. That's an indirect, data of indirect object. And the verb is? Cross Eferon. So that is an imperfect active indicative. That's right. They were bringing. And what is Auton case of use? That's right. Uh, he might touch them. Which has to be a native indirect. Well, it's a genitive. It's a genitive. Well, genitive, genitive what? <coughs> uh, now remember, verbs of, of sense, like touch and hear and all that kind of stuff, take their direct object in the genitive. So that's what this is, genitive of direct object. 
right? Yeah. Now, Hoy, there's an article. What use of the article is that? But the disciples. Paul, Paul says, uh, but the disciples uh, rebuked him. So it's, uh, let's see, that's a uh, controversy. Is that anaphoric? Yes, it is. Right? That means it's the, the disciples was used in the previous context. Or, and it could even be a, an article um, used with a well-known, you know, you know well-known entity. But anaphoric is probably the best usage. And so the, the disciples, are, what's autois? Autois is, uh, is what case in use? It's a native case. It's a native, plural term, third person. That's right. How's it used? He rebuked them. You read object? That's right. That's right. Um, and Jesus, uh, seeing after seeing. That's a participle. That's an error participle. Mm -hmm. Okay, so was indignant. Became came indignant you. and said to them. Said to them. Uh, what do you think our choice is? Anybody? Is it a of indirect? Indirect object, yeah. Because he said, and then the, the whole quote is kind of like the direct object, and he, he gave that quote to them. Okay, uh, allow the children uh, to come cross men toward me. It's right. interesting that you have the there. Okay. Yeah, allow the children to, now, and, and that's along with the allow, allow to, you, you expect I mean, it doesn't have to have an infinitive to complete it, that word, but it can. You know, um, let the children uh, approach me, really, and do not hinder them. For of such is the kingdom of God. Now, what case it uses is of such, tone, soyun tone. That's Opposition? I think content of such. No, it can't be opposition. What What is the article tone? How is that used there with that? Uh, first of all, generalizing or specializing use? It's uh, that's Yeah, okay. Connecting to the children, such as these children. All right. <coughs> um, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever uh, does not receive the kingdom of God as a child is not entering into it. I thought that was interesting because those are written, those verbs are subjunctive, but it's will not, easily will translated not. into future. I mean, yeah. I mean, content, the concept is more easily seen in the future. Will not enter in if you don't do it. That's right, and, and that's why an aorist subjunctive and a future subjunctive would have the same force, wouldn't they? Um, and, and anyway, um, something in the subjunctive is, is a potential, so we're talking about a potential future action anyway, right? So that's why, that's why it's, it works out that will not enter into it. Alright, uh, interesting, ace into, so there's, there's, there's the, the kingdom of God has some sort of a realm you enter into, doesn't it? So that's kind of an interesting way of looking at that. Alright. Um, and taking the children up into his arms, he, he blessed them. And, uh, and after hugging them, you might say, uh, yeah, he blessed them after placing the hand upon them. Now, here's a, here's a question. Tos, keros, that's in the accusative because it's a direct object, right? Uh, what's the use of the article there? Possessive. Possessive. He placed the hand on him. Well, what hand did he place on that? 
his hand. So that's a clear use of the possessive article right there. Do you see that? Uh, the only, there isn't anything else that's possessive there except that article. Upon them. That's fairly clear, isn't it? All right. Tethase is dated, right? No, Tethase, nope. that's a present, that, no, that's a participle, present participle. Uh, placing is in nope. on the. Tethase. Tethase? Yeah. Is, is it a dated participle? <coughs> present participle. Um, <laughs> no. I think it, <coughs> it's hard, but I think it's a nominative. Uh, present. The book doesn't say. It doesn't? I'm just, just going to check the book. Er, uh, is present participle? It's got to be present because it has the yoga. It doesn't even be present. It just says to face. Yeah. yeah. No, I think it's I think it's uh, non okay. Well, let's let's look at it from the standpoint of grammar. Um, I didn't know if that was like data. It means like he blesses them by placing his hands on. Or. That doesn't strike me as a dated form, even though it has the yodi, and I think it's nominative. But it's eros passive ending. I know. Phase, but I don't know if that works. But the theta, theta is actually into yeah, this part of the stem, but it could be doubling as part of the stem and part of it. That's not really present parts. Huh? It's a present part. When I first saw it, I took it as an eros part it's of the It's not present. But look under the me verb, look under two theme. Does that little chart that you had give you the me verbs? No, it just has a little. Oh. I'll let you know the present. I think we're going to find that it's a nominative. I think it is nominative. I was looking at this chart. Yeah, it's nominative. Eris passive. Well, I don't think it's Eris passive, though. If it's the thing. Because it can't be Eris because it's tit. You have a neoti reduplication. That means it has to be present. I got confused by that because it's exactly the same ending as an Eris passive ending, but it's not um, because, it, because it's tith. Now, I could be wrong about that because you have all kinds of irregularities. We look it up in the dictionary in the back of your Bible. I'll probably tell you. You have tith in the back of your dictionary. Right? It might. It um, I'm, I'm absolutely. I actually, I actually think I remember that form being in the dictionary there, but I could be wrong. Well, he blessed them, that's an heiress form. He blessed them by placing it in. Um, the face is a, just says, um, parsable. <laughs> so they don't even know. <laughs> nope. uh, the Pope doesn't say? He just says, uh, maybe you go for a test. I would be, wouldn't I? <laughs> Just for a professor. I would, yeah, for, for, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> so it's Tithes, participle Tithemi, put or lay. <laughs> so maybe nobody knows. Somebody knows. Ooh, ooh, look at this. Could it be? Could you have the proverbial jackpot? <laughs> present? There it is. It's present active, nominative, masculine, singular. That's what I said. <laughs> Stacy, that's what I said it was. That's awesome. Yeah, when you convinced me, yeah, that was my second guess after I knew the first one. You know. Okay, very nice. It is nominative. Wow, that really changes the whole thing. Why is it nominative? Because that's where the little letters are the top. No, no, but why would they use a nominative <laughs> form in this context? Because the the same person who is the subject of the the main verb of the sentence is also doing the action of the participle, right? But it's still um, when you, when we get to um, the uses of the participle, we still may have a uh, a participle that indicates the means by which he blessed them, or the mode by which he blessed them, right? So even though it isn't in dative, so you don't have to have a dative of means. He gave me a participle that indicates me. He blessed them, and that's a good question, placing his hand upon them. Well, when we get to participle, we start asking those questions. Did he bless them by placing his hand upon them? Did he bless them just as a circumstance? Placing, you know, just 
Well, what's the important? Kind of went along mean? with the blessing and put the hand on him, just as an attendant circumstance, or I think he was falling over. Outside, I guess I shouldn't read that much. <laughs> All right, um, seventeen. I'll try it. All right. And as he was coming out into the road, one running to him and kneeling before him asked him, mm -hmm. "Good teacher, what must I do in order to receive or inherit eternal life?" All right, to inherit eternal life. All right. Yeah, and in order that I might inherit eternal life, in order to inherit eternal life, still gets the same sense. So they're both good English translations. But if you want to stay closer to, you know, the be a more wooden literal translation, in order that I might inherit eternal life, yeah, is a little, is a little stricter toward, uh, toward the text. Although they, in English, they would be the same thing. That's very good. That's a question. That's an interrogative, isn't it? Uh, all right. Who would like to read 18? I'll read one. All right. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? All right. No one is good except one, God. All right, good. Could you also say keep going? Yeah. Did you say? Yeah, keep going. Could you also say what? Except God alone. I mean, it's kind of the same concept, similar concept. Except for yeah, except God, God alone. Uh, yeah, but again, that's not as strictly literal to the text. Right. But you know, it it, it getting at the sense of it absolutely. You know. Um, but let me, just let me ask you, um, uh That's a nominative, right? Yeah. What use of the nominative? Um, um, okay. You're asking for the nominative, not the article, right? Right. Predicate nominative. <coughs> Could you say simple apposition or no? Yes. So yeah. it is. It's an apposition to one. Except except one, one. that Sorry. is God. Sorry. Very nice. <coughs> okay, keep going, Pastor Joe. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not let me see here. Commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Um, oh, honor your father and your mother. Okay, excellent. You know the commandments, right? Uh, what use of the article is that? Clearly, I think it's clearly the use of the word. <laughs> well known. Huh? Well known. That's right. Commandments are very well known. Par excellence, you know, the greatest commandments ever. Well, maybe, I don't think so. Jesus said the greatest commandment is something else. I don't know the Ten Commandments. You're talking about the Ten Commandments, right? You know the commandments. I think they're, I think they're well known. Par excellence, you could probably make an argument for that, but it'd be weak. Yeah. Uh -oh. Who won? Who won? Not me, it's only wife. You want to take a shot at 20? 20, and he said, and he said to him, Whoa, whoa, share the wealth. <laughs> uh, all of these things I have kept from my youth. Okay, what does that word, efu laksa, mean? What is that really? I, well, I kept, it's an heiress. Well, we're talking about keeping commands, yeah. Uh, it's an heiress, middle, um, deponent. But what, what does their vocabulary literally mean? A guard. No, to guard. Now, when you're talking about commandments, you could say I've kept, certainly, but it literally means to guard. So, the teacher, all these things I have guarded from my youth. Um, now, ek, neatetas, that's a genitive or ablative form, right? But what kind of ablative that would be? From my youth. 
give a is it going to give us a genitive category that will fit that? Could be a genitive of time. <coughs> well, you'd say it's genitive after certain prepositions, I suppose. But mm -hmm. um, you know, there there certainly is a time aspect. Somebody on this side then want to do 21? Yes. All right. Thank you. Treasure in heaven, come follow me. Right. What are we looking at? The ending on Fakal Fe. Fakal Fe? Yeah. Well, that's just, um, that's a, it's an A ending contracted with epsilon, so you get the A ending. Oh, yeah. Okay. Unless it is, let's see. No, I'm wrong about that. I mean, I think that contraction is the case, but that's not really what you have here. Akal Fe. That is the A ending of an imperative contracted okay. with the A, you get A. Okay. So it's an imperative. Principle, like present, negative. Right, yeah. And that's probably an ambiguous form. Uh, I, I was stuck on this set up here. Um, what case is set? Accusative. Yeah. So look at that. Now, the, even the English translations, I think, translate that as a, as a uh, subject of that. But one you are lacking. But that's sad. That's the object of that word. One is missed by you? That doesn't even... Well, one is missed by you. That's not quite... That doesn't quite get accused of either. Uh, one, one thing missed you lack. You. One missed you. Well, that puts the that's you as the subject. One thing yeah. you lack. One got by you, maybe. <laughs> yeah, since he's guarding it. Now, is this, the meaning essentially the same? One thing you lack, but you know, really, I think it's one thing you got by you, basically. Since Sarah is accused of this. So, it's kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> yeah, sell and give, those are aorists, right? How do you tell DOS? That is an MS DOS, by the way. How do you tell that DOS is aorist? What's it from? It's from uh, mm -hmm. Didymi. Didymi, how do you tell it's aorist? No iota reduplication. And that's what helped us on the tit in titis, right? Iota there told us it was present. Um, it's, in, it's interesting, it says, uh, instead of saying all, it says hasa, which would be as much as you have. Right, right. Which would be all you have, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. As, as many things as you have, uh, sell and give to poor. Those are both aorist imperatives, right? <coughs> And you will have treasure. All right, 22. You were shocked upon the city, and you went away um, grieving. Well, you was one having much wealth. 
All right, and this is a little bit of a different use of epi. He was, um, you know, again, it's not wicked. There are other prepositions that we would you could use there, and not bad an eye at. But he was he was shocked or gloomy upon the saying, upon the word. Well, what do you think that means? Huh? You couldn't believe it. You couldn't follow it, but I'm talking about the preposition upon. Why is that upon? It's a similar idiom in English, isn't it? On the basis of that, you know, upon that, <coughs> we don't really say upon that, we say on the basis of that. Uh, so that's kind of the idea. So yeah, if we would call that. That's right. <coughs> All right. Um, there's some other good things in the next few verses, so let's just take a look at a few of them. Uh, and after looking around, Jesus says to his disciples um, how difficult for those having um, many things or you know possessions those having um, for those having a lot of possessions uh, to enter into the kingdom of God um, then thing that you say to enter into that you have peace and I think he talks about redundant prepositions and that, that you wouldn't actually have to have that ace. <clears throat> um, you wouldn't have to have either one of those. I mean, you'd have, one of those is necessary, but you wouldn't have to have both of them. Um, so we're talking about entry into something. So that's, that's kind of an interesting logical motion kind of concept, isn't it? Um, but tell me about two theu. What, what use of the article was there? <coughs> Remember the rule that says if a noun, um, if a head noun has a noun and a genitive with it, and the head noun has an article, the noun and the genitive will have an article. You remember it now. Well, that's what that's the rule that's going on there. So the head noun is kingdom, and since kingdom has an article, then the of, of noun, of God, needs to have an article with it. All right, so the disciples were amazed on the basis of his words, or by his words, or however you want to do that, epi. And um, Jesus, again, answers and says to them, uh, children, uh, how difficult is it or it, it, no, no. it is it is difficult to enter into the kingdom of God. Um, and the same construction with the preposition of the verb, except this time the verb is infinitive. That's right, it's an aorist infinitive, that's right, same construction. And it says it's, it is easier for a camel through the eye of a needle to pass, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle, and for a rich man <coughs> into the kingdom of God to enter. And so uh, they were uh, exceedingly amazed, uh, saying to one another, um, and Kai is kind of, you know, an emphatic kind of thing there, um, who is able to be saved? And so uh, after, and this is the same word that Jesus looked at the rich man and loved him. Um, M, M, left sauce, that's a prepositional prefix. What preposition? N. N. That's N. right. And so, you know, you just want to make it easier to say, euphonics, right? So we change that to a move, the new to a move. So, you know, literally it would be Jesus looked in them. Um, now that might be, you know, 
that might be creating or committing root error, you know, to look at, but, but it fits, doesn't it? You know, I mean, it's almost as if Jesus looked, looked inside them and really saw them for who they were, right? So Jesus, after looking at them, says, uh, with men, it is, impossible. Yeah, it is impossible. Now, that's interesting. Para, what does para mean? Huh? What, what word comes from para that we know really well in English? Parallel. Right? So, parachute. <laughs> yeah? I never thought of it. Parachute. Well, what's a shoot to begin with? I don't know. Um, parallel. So, para means alongside. So, you know, a, alongside or, or next to men. <clears throat> this is kind of interesting because, um, you know, how else, and, and that's a good question to answer. How else could he have said this, right? Um, you know, next to men, it is impossible. But um, not next to God. For all things are possible next to God. Right? Um, I mean, it, it comes across to me as almost is almost, um, you know, who you would run to and get close to for benefit or for help, right? If you're getting close to men in order to enter into the kingdom of God, um, then it's not possible. But if you're, you know, next to God, it is possible. But I don't know. I mean, that's it's something to ponder. Why does he... Why does he use that kind of terminology, para? And what could he have used? Um, it's, just, it's, it's just kind of different, isn't it? All right. Um, here's where Peter says, he's, we've left all things and followed you. you know? Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, no one, and this is interesting, no one, um, there is no one who uh, left a house, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or fields, on account of me, and on account of the gospel. And I think that's so interesting right there. I mean, you know, we talk about suffering for Christ. Well, what is Christ's mission? The thing I'm trying to drive home at my church is, we know what our eternal purpose is, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever or by enjoying it forever, you know, we'll look at that, right? We know what our eternal purpose is, but we're totally clueless about what our temporal purpose is. Right? Why are we here? Why am I still here and I'm not in heaven? And our, my temporal purpose is to make disciples. And evangelism is central to that, right? So we've got nailed what our eternal purpose is, to glorify God. But we are completely clueless what our temporal purpose is. And as a church, basically, we are blowing off our temporal purpose. Pine in the sky when we die. Yeah. So, you know, I really am trying to drive home to my church. Why are we here? Now, I know why I am. But why am I here? Am I still here? <laughs> yeah. Why am I here? Right? So, and, and interestingly, he says, no one who's given up these things for my sake and for the gospel um, uh, will not receive back a hundredfold, right? Except he receive a hundredfold now in this time, right? Uh, of houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and fields uh, with persecution. Father that yeah, they do. That's kind of interesting. That's good. <laughs> That's got to disappoint the part of the surgical people. Yeah, right. And in the age coming, eternal life. Eternal life. Yeah. Um, many who are first. Last? Well, many, many first will be last, I would say, because that's the future of Amy. And um, 
the last first. Uh, I don't know what that does to our theology. If you give up stuff for Christ and the gospel here, you're going to get a hundredfold. I'm not sure you can believe that, can you? Because he makes a distinction in this life, and then you're going to get life eternal in the, in the coming age. I don't know. I guess maybe if I'd give it up more, I might be richer. Or maybe I have to be rich. I'll take your truck. <laughs>